Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number four, or video two of two in the subsection on the law of Bohr and Savar. Specifically, I'm going to derive the magnetic field of a circular current loop. In video number one and two of this section, I discuss the Lorentz force law and currents and the continuity equation. In video three, I had the first video in the subsection on Bohr and Savar, and I derived the magnetic field of a straight current carrying wire. So clearly in this particular video number four, we're building on what we did in video number three by going to a circular current loop or a circular wire. It's important to note that I've derived the law of Bohr and Savar in my video section on the vector calculus for electromagnetism video number 46. In order to derive the law of Bohr and Savar, we require vector calculus and a small bit of magnetostatics. And it's a reasonably involved derivation. So if you can't follow the derivation, that's no big deal. I would suggest to you the best way to look at it is uh, thinking of it as an experimental observation. So let's begin. So on the top left of your screen, I've tried to illustrate the situation. What we have is a circular current loop drawn in purple. Note that the current is coming in on the bottom and is exiting on the top. Now it's important to note where it is that I'm trying to evaluate the magnetic field due to this circular current loop. And it is on axis, we say. So we go to the center of the current loop, which is illustrated by the purple dot, or the, uh, the wine dot, I suppose. And we're perpendicular to that along the x-axis. And I've illustrated the detector by this I here. And we're trying to calculate the magnetic field at this point. Of course, it'll be different if we calculate it off axis. Note that the circular current loop lives on the ZY plane. Now, by the law of B. and Savar, we're required to define the infinitesimal line segment and the separation vector. So I've drawn one of the infinitesimal line segments here, dL prime. The reason we give it a prime is to note that we're dealing with sources, and of course we're talking about electric charges or current. So dL prime in this case is pointing in the negative z direction, this particular, uh, this particular dL prime. Now, the separation vector in this case, and I should give its direction, is an acute angle between the infinitesimal line segment and the, uh, the detector's position. Whereas in the last video, it was an obtuse angle, and we, for that reason we required other angles, uh, which I used beta and gamma, but we don't need them this time. So we can just take the sine of the angle theta as it is an acute angle. And I think that is, I think that gives us everything we need to begin. So I've noted the law of Bo and Savar here. So we ne you need to take mu zero over i, mu zero times i divided by four pi, outside of the line integral of dl prime crossed with the infinite, excuse me, with the separation unit vector divided by the square of the magnitude of the separation vector. So we first of all need to define what the square of the magnitude of the separation vector is. Now if you look closely, it's going to be equal to x squared plus a squared. The x component clearly comes because the detector is on the x-axis, and the radius of the circular current loop is a, so that's why we have this, this, uh, this element a here. So the separation vector squared is x squared plus a squared. Now we need to note the directions as well. So if you look, dl and the dl prime in this case, let's say, is going in the, in the negative z direction. But it's pretty obvious that the separation vector is going to be perpendicular to any infinitesimal line segment which we have. So where do we go from there? Now it might require a small bit of consideration to convince yourself that that is the case. But if you think carefully enough, you'll see and most likely be convinced that dl prime is in fact perpendicular to the separation vector. What does this mean? It means that we're going to have the sine of 90 degrees, which is 1, and we're going to have the resulting, the resulting magnetic field as mu zero i divided by 4 pi outside of the line integral of dl prime divided by x squared plus a squared. So we're nearly there. That's probably the hardest part. It's probably also reasonably difficult to visualize the actual direction of the magnetic field. I'm going to tell you that the magnetic field is located in the x, y plane. So how do we go about visualizing it? Well, I've drawn the z, the x, and the y axes again, and I've drawn the position of the detector, or excuse me, the detector. 
So I've kept the same infinitesimal line segment dl prime, and that of course is in the negative z direction, but it's cutting the y axis. Now, looking closely, we can see that we're going to have the following plane made but by dl prime and the separation vector. Now if we take the cross product of dl prime and the separation vector, we must get a vector which is perpendicular to the plane which they make themselves. So I've illustrated the plane here. And this should help you to visualize the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is perpendicular to that. If you look closely, that's in the xy plane and it has no z component. To illustrate this, let's actually compute one of the many cross products that could be computed. Let's say we have the infinitesimal line segment uh, dl prime as z k hat. Now I know that would be going in the opposite direction than the one I've drawn up here, but it doesn't really matter. And let's say the separation vector is ai hat plus bj hat. So it's in the xy plane. So computing the cross product is pretty straightforward and we'll see that we're going to have z times b in the i hat direction plus z times a in the j hat direction and zero in the k hat direction, which means we have a vector in the x, y plane. Now it's time to move on. So we know the magnetic field has no component in the z axis or the z direction. It has only components in the x and y directions. Now here comes a small bit of symmetry and it helps very much so to simplify the, uh, the problem. Let's look here. We're going to be integrating along a circle. So if you think about it, every, com every, uh, every contribution made by a component of the magnetic field in the y direction, as we go around the first semicircle, will be opposite in magnitude, directly, e exactly opposite in magnitude, to what we'll get as we go through the sem second semicircle. So any components, let's say we have a b sub y in the first semicircle, it's going to be minus what we're going to get in the opposite direction. Say a column sub y1 and sub y2. So the net result is that all our y components are going to cancel out. And that is a symmetry argument which I'm sure you'll have seen in the past and we'll certainly see again in the future. So it happens when we integrate across a circle and we're looking to evaluate it above a circle or away from its uh, away from the plane which it lies. So before we say that, we know that the magnetic field can be broken down into two components, b sub x, which is the magn magnitude of the magnetic field multiplied by cosine of theta, and b sub y, which is the magnitude multiplied by sine of theta. I've just told you, however, that the y component is going to go to zero. So we're only left with the x component of the magnetic field. So where do we go from here? So just to rewrite the law of BO and Savar as we had it in the previous page, and the cosine and sine of theta. I said a moment ago that we don't need the sine of theta, but we're just going to keep it there for the moment anyway. All right, so just, just let me confirm it was the sine. Yes, in fact, it was the sine. That is correct. So just, I suppose, for for completeness, I've put all the, uh, the two components there, even though we know that b sub y is going to sum to zero. Now, this rotational symmetry is important in that it simplifies the problem, but if you want, you can ignore the fact that you have rotational symmetry and compute the y integrals as normal and they'll just sum to zero. But just to recap, we have rotational symmetry about the x-axis. Any y contribution on the magnetic field from zero to pi will be cancelled by any y contribution from pi to two pi. Thus the magnitude of b sub y is going to be zero. Next let's look at the integral of dl prime. Well the integral of dl prime is simply going to give us twice pi times the radius, we're going to get the circumference of our circle. So that means that the magnitude of the magnetic field is simply going to be its x-coordinate, which is mu zero i over four pi, multiplied by twice pi a squared over x squared plus a squared to the three over two. Or we can simplify it as mu zero i over two, and we have a squared divided by x squared plus a squared to the three over two. Note, and it's very important to say this, that this is where we measure the magnetic field on axis. So we measure it here perpendicular to the center of the uh, of the circle. It'll be different, of course, if I was to measure it over here. If I had my detector over in this direction here, then I would I would have a different value, or I'd, I would evaluate the uh, the magnetic field to be different. So.
So that's pretty straightforward. Now just to confirm something here, we're talking about a, the magnetic field of a current loop. And in order to define which direction the magnetic field goes, we are required to use the right hand rule. So this is our right hand, and I've discussed both the right hand and left hand rules. Excuse me, I don't know why I gave that an L, it should be right. So this is a right hand. So in this case, let's say the current is going in a, uh, an anti-clockwise direction. What we do is we curl our fingers of our right hand in the direction of the current and our thumb now points perpendicular, excuse me, perpendicular to of course that area, but it's in the direction of the magnetic field. And conversely here, if we curl our fingers of our right hand in the direction of the current, we find that the magnetic field corresponding to our thumb perpendicular to that is in the downward direction. Now, the magnetic field we computed so far is for a single loop. But I suppose you, it stands only to reason that when the loop has n turns and we're measuring the field on axis, then it's going to be n times the magnetic field for a single loop. So we have this particular equation on the top right of your screen, measuring the magnetic field for an on-axis loop of n turns. Where is this important? Well, it's important for electric generators and electric motors, which use uh, many, many loops, and they also use bar magnets as well. So that's how you calculate the magnetic field on axis. And I'd just like to show you a quicker or simpler way to do it. Uh, you know, it's just in not involving the components. I've drawn the same thing again, but in a slightly different way. And we see that we have our circular current loop in purple. We have a radius, I'm going to call it capital R in this particular case. We have our infinitesimal line segment DL prime again. And note, of course, that we have this separation vector, so it's going in this direction. And our detector will be in here. Now, perhaps this particular uh, illustration, or this particular diagram, will help convince you that DL is in actual fact perpendicular to the infinitesimal line segment. And also we can see we have rotational symmetry of course, and B sub Z is simply going to be exactly what we got a moment ago. Uh, I've not done the integral of course this time, just, just for, just for it's, it's only there for completeness. And finally, just to remind you, magnetism is caused by moving electric charges. Stationary charges produce an electric field only, and moving electric charges produce both an electric and magnetic field. So, thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.